This is Rescue Shuttle Control, checking in on day 29. The big day has finally arrived. We're approaching your final landing. All of our telemetry indicates that your trajectory is looking good and you're on target. And uh, the uh, main thing that we have to do now is prepare you for the uh, manual phase of the landing. Because the uh, atmospheric conditions and the weather at the landing site are not uh, predictable in advance, it requires manual intervention by you, the pilot, in order to achieve a safe landing. So we're going to concentrate today on the final steps necessary in order to configure your systems for that uh, approach and landing phase. We've got a lot to cover today. There's uh, some very important final preparations that we need to make sure that we're clear on and that you've adequately rehearsed so that the landing will go smoothly. The first and most crucial order of business today is to uh, talk a little bit about the wiring. Uh, during our last few sessions together, we uh, have not changed the wiring at all on our hero, thinking that uh, that would be the way we would have it configured for the, the final landing. But uh, we've recently uh, noticed that there is an incompatibility and we need to do an urgent reconfiguration in order for this to work successfully. You may recall that uh, up to now we haven't been using the uh, rotary encoder uh, except some time ago uh, on about day 18 when we uh, first uh, were practicing using that. We have the rotary encoder connected to our, our hero, but it's necessary to connect that to the digital input-output lines uh, rather than the uh, analog lines as we had it configured earlier. So a very important and urgent uh, modification that you'll need to pay attention to is connecting the three pins, the clock, DT, and switch lines of the rotary encoder. We formerly had them connected over here to the A labeled pins, and instead we've swapped those with the uh, digital pins that are being used, that were used to be used uh, by the um, dip switch. The dip switch doesn't care whether you're using the uh, digital pins or the analog pins, and so we've swapped those. So you'll notice now that the uh, switches corresponding to dip switch one, two, and three are these yellow, green, and orange wires that are now connected to the uh, analog pins A1, A2, and A3. And that frees up the digital pins over here where uh, the purple, gray, and white wire right here, purple, gray, and white, are connected to the uh, digital pins 4, 3, and 2. And we'll check and make sure that that wiring agrees with what we have in our code. So that's an important hardware modification that you need to make sure and verify before uh, we uh, get into the landing phase. Let's turn our attention now to the code. There's quite a bit to take in today because we're bringing together everything that we've learned over the last 28 sessions. So let's uh, have a look from the top. We'll uh, begin by looking at the new variables that we're introducing. And actually, before we lock, look at the new variables, let's just double check that our pin uh, assignments are as expected. As you'll notice here now, we've got the rotary encoder pins uh, set to 2, 3, and 4. 2 is the encoder clock, 3 is the encoder digital uh, input, and 4 is the uh, switch uh, pin that we're actually not using in this application. And you'll notice that uh, unlike before, our dip switch pins have been changed over to A1, A2, and A3. So double check and make sure that your wiring is uh, agreeing with these definitions. All right, so let's uh, move on. Let's talk about the new variables that we're going to be using to uh, execute the logic in today's landing code. As we scroll down, we see a lot of familiar definitions, things that uh, we've been using over the last few sessions. And then we uh, encounter some new ones. You'll notice that there's a new variable here called final D that stands for 
final descent, and that will be either true or false, zero or one, depending upon uh, what phase we're in in the landing. We've got uh, a long variable that's going to count the time going by in previous millisecond. It's initialized to zero here, but it will be updated, and you'll see how that works in the code. Uh, we've got another uh, variable here called system error. We hope we don't see that one uh, set to one, but this will indicate to us if there's a, a problem during our descent. Uh, we've also got some uh, new variables that uh, we encountered before when we were working with the rotary encoder. Our counter that will uh, basically indicate the status of rotation of our manual altitude control. Uh, we've got uh, another variable here that's uh, sort of uh, echoing counter. It's the uh, altitude target. So altitude is what we're aiming for. Counter is what we're actually doing as we rotate the encoder. And we've also got these variables, current state clock and last date clock, that we use in our logic as we did in our earlier uh, examples. So that, along with another variable called ready, that you'll see how that's used, are uh, pretty much summarizes the new variables that we'll be using. The next thing to notice, as I scroll down here, you'll see familiar things like our, uh, our keypad is defined, our bitmap pictures that we'll be using on our OLED display are defined as before. So if I quickly scroll all the way down past all of the bitmaps and get into the code, you'll notice one change in organization here. We've moved our setup and loop routines to the very end of the file. They're not right here where you might be used to seeing them. We put them at the very end of the file so that they will basically occur after the definitions of all the functions that are called from the setup and loop routines so that there won't be any problems about these not knowing that those functions are defined. So we'll go down to the bottom right now and look at setup and loop and then work our way back up to see all the different functions that are called and used by setup and loop. So let's look first at uh, setup. Setup actually has relatively little that's new for us, uh, except we're bringing together things that we've learned in different sessions. So you'll notice that we have our pin mode calls that set up our, our dip switches and our landing LED. Uh, we've got pin mode calls that set up the clock and DT pins for the rotary encoder. And uh, you may recall that uh, that's just like what we did before. And we also have something else that we worked with previously in the rotary encoder, and that is we set up interrupts. So these calls to attach interrupt start the hero looking for interrupt signals coming any time that the rotary encoder has been moved. And so any time something like that happens, you'll recall that a special routine is called the interrupt service routine, whose name is update encoder. Uh, that's the same name that we used in our previous example. So um, that pretty much summarizes what's happening in setup. Uh, what's happening in, in the loop routine is also pretty familiar, but with just a little bit of a twist. The main thing that's going on in loop as it's executed over and over again is our good old friend, the picture loop, which will constantly be calling draw, which has the main job of updating what's being shown on the OLED display. But it's also doing some other things, as we've seen before, uh, having to do with keypad input and things like that. So we'll dive into draw and see what's happening there as picture loop is executed. Something else then that uh, is unique to today's exercise is we need to uh, pay attention to the actual amount of time that's going by. Because as our spacecraft is descending towards landing, we need to uh, keep track of the real time that's going by. So uh, current millisecond right here is set to the value of measured milliseconds since the start of program execution. And you'll remember that uh, if we difference two different calls to millisecond and divide by a thousand, that'll tell us how many seconds have gone by. So what we do is we have a test here. It says if the current millisecond 
minus previous millisecond is greater than or equal to 1,000, that means one second has gone by. And so if this is true, then we reset previous millisecond to current millisecond. And if it's time to do so, we advance the landing countdown. And so these are all functions that we're going to dive into. We're going to dive into draw. We're going to dive into advanced countdown. And advanced countdown will be called every time the clock goes by a thousand milliseconds. So that pretty much covers what's happening in loop. So let's go to draw and look at what's familiar and what's new to us in draw. So we'll scroll up past some of these other routines that we'll be seeing shortly and find draw. Okay, here we are. So here's draw, and you'll notice some familiar things. Uh, in addition to setting up the uh, U8G OLED display panel, we're uh, calling pilot keypad check, just as we did in our last session. And pilot keypad check, you will recall, and we'll review this, is uh, looking for input on our keypad. Now, what happens in addition to the keypad check is all of these things happening in this switch block down here, controlled by whatever the current value of display bitmap is. Display bitmap can have its value changed from its initial default face to some other, depending upon the current status of the flight. And um, so you'll see here that uh, depending upon the value of the display bitmap, we can change it to all these different uh, possible displays. And so that is basically the important thing that's happening here in draw is the keypad check and changing the uh, bitmap display to display the current status. Okay, so let's move on to keypad check because that's an important one. Pilot keypad check. If we go down and look and see what that's doing, it's right here. And it's familiar to us as well. It uh, checks to see whether or not the dip switches have been configured correctly to enter the final landing phase. That's what happens when we call calculate face and we see that switch is activated, is, has been set to one. Before that's the case, calculate face will return a negative one and switch activated will be zero and keypad check will return without doing anything further. However, if the switches have been correctly activated, as we discussed in our previous session, then we'll come through and execute the next uh, set of uh, statements here. So uh, next, if the um, variable final descent, final D, has been set equal to one, then we're going to no longer respond to any keypad input because we're going to be on manual descent. However, before that's the case, the default value of final D is zero. We'll drop down here. We'll call custom key and get a keypad input. And we'll check to see if it's the correct keypad input, which you'll recall for our mission is program A. So if A has been pressed, then we do just as we did in our last session. We uh, set was pressed equal to one and return. Next time through, we switch the bitmap to three check marks and we return. So that is uh, mostly familiar stuff. And that's what's happening when pilot keypad check is called up here every time draw is called in the loop. All right, uh, so we're done with keypad check. Let's uh, refresh ourselves about calculate face, although it hasn't really changed from what we did before. So uh, we can uh, go over that relatively quickly. Uh, here's calculate face. And you'll remember that uh, what calculate face does is during the early phase of our descent, it's checking to make sure that the dip switches have been flipped in the correct sequence and gives us feedback on the display and the OLED display to tell us that uh, what the status of the throttle is and whether you are uh, increasing the throttle at correct sequence.
So uh, nothing really uh, changes there in calculate phase. All right, uh, so now uh, onto some somewhat new material. Let's look at what happens with update encoder. You'll remember that update encoder is not called directly by either setup or loop. It gets called whenever an interrupt occurs, and an interrupt occurs whenever the um, rotary encoder is changed, is, is rotated any amount. So let's go down and have a look at update encoder, which is our inter interrupt service routine. And uh, some of this will be familiar to you from when we discussed the rotary encoder, but some of this is going to be a little bit you know, unique to our, our job today. So first thing we do in update encoder this time is we check to see whether or not we're in the terminal descent phase. So um, we have to have set what pressed uh, was pressed equal to one because the correct uh, program was entered. And if that's not the case, then we return without doing anything. But otherwise, we set the ready flag to true, to one, and then we go about reading the state of the encoder. And now this will be familiar to you from our earlier routine. We check to see what's happened to the encoder, whether it's rotating clockwise or counterclockwise, and accordingly take counter, which is now going to be representing our actual altitude and either increase it or decrease it. And so this will give us the ability to, by hand, control the altitude as we're descending and keep our altitude in line with the target altitude that our computer is feeding us. So counter will either be increased or decreased depending upon whether or not the encoder is being rotated clockwise or counterclockwise. And in order to give us some additional feedback, we'll have feedback from our OLED display, but we'll also have numerical feedback available to us on the serial monitor. So we can look at the serial monitor as the descent is proceeding and we can see how counter and altitude compare with one another. We want to try to keep them as close together as possible because if counter gets more than five meters away from target altitude, then an abort will be declared and we'll have to start over. So that is uh, what's happening that's different in update encoder is that now uh, rather than encoder just giving us numbers on a display, it's controlling the descent rate and altitude of our spacecraft. This uh, setting current st uh, last state back to current state before we return, you'll remember is what we had to do before so that the next time we come to update encoder, it can compare the new state with whatever the last saved one was. All right, so that uh, gives us pretty much everything we need to know about update encoder. And so now we have one last very important routine to uh, look into, and this is advanced countdown. You'll remember that advanced countdown was called every one second during the, the loop. So let's see if we can find that. Here it is. So here's our loop. Every time the millisecond function rolled over a thousand, then if the ready the ready flag is true, then we call advanced countdown. So let's look at advanced countdown because this is brand new and it's important that we understand what it's doing and how it works. So here we go. Here is advanced countdown. The first thing advanced countdown does is it sets the final descent flag to true and it takes the target altitude and reduces it by one meter. So every time a second goes by, the target altitude will be uh, reduced by one meter. Next, what we need to do is we need to compare the target altitude with the manual control counter. And so uh, you can see that that's happening here in different tests. For example, if altitude is greater than counter, or in other words, if the manual uh, controlled altitude is less than the target altitude, then we're descending too fast. And so we need to give feedback to the pilot that says don't descend so fast. 
And that will occur in two ways. We'll be able to see the numbers on the serial monitor, and we'll also see on the U8G panel, on the OLED display, a picture that basically says, go up because you're going down too fast. The uh, reverse of that is if the target altitude is less than the counter, we aren't descending fast enough, we need to go down faster. And so uh, we'll accordingly be able to see that on the serial monitor and the UHG display will have a corresponding display on it that says you're descending too slowly, uh, so go down more. Finally, uh, let's see, if the difference between altitude and counter reaches the uh, threshold of, of five meters, then that will declare an emergency, will be too far out of range. And so we'll uh, um, set an error flag. It'll cause us to go back up to 30 meters reset and you'll have an opportunity, at least until your fuel runs out, to try the descent again. So that's what's happening here. And the uh, last little check here, which was up at the top, but we skipped over it, is what happens when the altitude actually reaches zero. Because when the altitude reaches zero and we have not declared any errors because we're within five meters of, of target, then uh, we can go ahead set the uh, landing indicator to on. So the blue light, the blue landing light will come on and we can set the display to landing has been achieved. So that is pretty much everything that's going to take place uh, ideally in uh, your landing uh, later today. You'll wanna make sure that you have this code correctly uh, implemented and tested. And it also requires some practice on your part because learning how to control the um, descent rate manually, which is necessary, requires a little practice. So you may want to simulate this a few times before the actual landing occurs. We have the greatest confidence in your abilities, though, and we'll be looking uh, forward to uh, your successful landing shortly. Um, want to remind you that it's very important before you begin your descent to make sure that the uh, dip switches are in the reset, the off position to start. And uh, so what we'll do right now is we'll go through a dry run and we'll test our code and make sure that it works. And we'll try to uh, um, execute a mock landing here. So what I'm going to do is first thing I'm going to do is verify my code, check it, that it compiles. Okay, that looks good. We're using 81% of uh, program storage space, which is a lot, but uh, it looks like uh, we should be fine. The next thing that I'm going to do is upload the code. So let's go ahead and upload it. Even though it's uploaded, nothing should be happening until uh, we go ahead and, and initiate uh, our sequence with the dip switches and the keypad. So uh, we don't have to get too uh, nervous yet. Uploading is underway. Uploading is complete. Okay, we have our uh, default uh, face uh, displayed on the OLED display. I'm going to uh, put the uh, serial monitor window in view here so that we can be looking at this as we're going through our descent. All right, so when the time comes, we initiate our landing phase with low throttle phase. So low throttle phase is good. That needs to be executed first. Once the low throttle uh, deceleration phase is complete, then we throttle up to mi medium throttle. Everything's looking good. We've got the right feedback on the OLED display. And so finally we go to high throttle. High throttle is the uh, last phase before we uh, switch over to manual control and start uh, the, the final descent towards the surface. Now, uh, before I do this, because once I press the A button, the program will begin to execute. And then the first time that I rotate the rotary encoder, then uh, our descent will be underway and the countdown towards landing will be underway. We'll have to split our attention between what's happening on the serial monitor 
and the feedback that we're getting on the OLED display. So try to pay attention to both of those as, as we're heading down towards the surface. So let's see if we can go ahead and execute the landing correctly. All right, program A has been entered. We have three check marks, which indicates that we're in good shape. And now I'm going to start the descent by rotating the manual control. Okay, we're down to 28 meters, 27. We're looking good, 25. We're a little bit low right now. Okay, we're right on. Okay. All right, I need to go down more, more. All right. Okay, I went down a little too fast. But uh, okay, let's see here. All right, I'm close, I'm within one meter. Let's go down a little faster. Two, and there we go. Altitude is zero. I only missed it by two meters. We've got landing light is on and we are on the surface. So that is what a successful landing looks like. And I am sure that your landing will be successful as well. I would love to greet you on your landing at the spaceport. However, you may be aware that uh, I'm actually an AI that was programmed several hundred years ago. And so I was uh, made with primitive technology by your present day standards. But this present, this uh, ancient technology was uh, what uh, got you back. And so uh, I wish you across the centuries good luck and great success uh, as you head back towards your homes. And with that, I would like to remind you to build everything and fly safe.